everyone, and thank you for coming to the Northeast Tri-State Regional Community Workshop today. We appreciate you participating on a Saturday. We know you all have lots of choices out there, but this is a choice we want you to have. My name is Kelly Cox, and I'm Director of Support Groups and Senior Regional Community Workshops for the International Milam Foundation, a job I've had for over 20 years now. That surprises me every time I say it. And this is about our 118th or so regional community workshop. So you can say we know a few of these. The IMF has been in operation for 31 years, and you can find out about it, everything you need about myeloma at myeloma.org. Next slide, please. I want to thank our generous sponsors, Amgen, Bristol Myers Squibb, Cario Farm, Takeda, Janssen, and GSK. Without their generous support, this would not be possible. Next slide. All right, we have an action-packed warning. First one that you spoke to or heard from is myself. The next doctor you're going to hear from is Dr. Jonathan Kaufman. He's from the Winship Cancer Center or Institute, excuse me, Jonathan, at Emory University. He's going to be discussing myeloma 101 and frontline therapy. We'll have a little question and answer period with our both our panelists, which will be Jonathan Kaufman and David Wiesel and David ben David Daniel, I always screw up your last name. I'm sorry about that. That will take us to the 12 o'clock hour where we'll, we'll be putting a question and answer on with the panelists, and then we'll be taking a break from the day. And right after that point, you'll get a request to fill out the, the feedback uh, survey. Please do, and thank you very much. I'd like to introduce a dear friend and a doctor that works with myeloma, Dr. Jonathan Kaufman. Welcome, Jonathan. Uh, good morning. Um, thank you, Kelly, and thank you, um, uh, for having me uh, participate in one of these programs again. Um, I've uh, really enjoyed this over the years. Today, I'm going to be presenting Myoma 101 and Frontline Therapy. And when I think about um, uh, who the audience is for this, th I think about a patient I'm seeing for the first time who, um, is, who doesn't know anything about myeloma or plasma cell disorders. So that's where, that's where I'll be coming from. Um, all right, what is myeloma? How do we stage myeloma? How do we diagnose myeloma? What are our treatment options? And then when we dive into treatment options, I'm not gonna go over every two, three, and four drug therapy, um, but I will talk about overall where the role of stem cell transplant is, high-dose chemotherapy, and autologous stem cell transplant. Uh, a lot of times today, this morning, I'll be saying things several times, um, but I'm doing that intentionally so that uh, we should really try to drive things home. Who gets myeloma? It's slightly more common in men than women. The, it is significantly, the incidence that is uh, likely to get myeloma is higher in Black Americans than non-Black Americans. The average age is in the somewhere in the late 60s. Um, a, uh, a, a, very, a, small, a very small percentage of patients gets it uh, at, a, at less than 40 years old. Myeloma is cancer of plasma cells. What are plasma cells? Plasma cells are a, uh, a, an immune cell that are primarily in our bone marrow. And the job in life of a plasma cell is to make antibodies to help fight and prevent infection. And so I'll use the word antibody as the lay term and immunoglobulin as the medical term. And I will use those interchangeably. The other words that I will use interchangeably today are multiple myeloma and myeloma. Multiple myeloma is myeloma. Myeloma is multiple myeloma. Antibodies, immunoglobulins. If I, I, if I say them, I, I, I mean they're, they're completely interchangeable, and I don't mean any difference when I say uh, these words. Uh, um, so when we talk about plasma cells going from normal to, um, normal to abnormal, that's what we call discretion. And there are, uh, and I'll go over this a, a little bit in, in a few slides, um, th there are an excessive amount of plasma cells in the bone marrow. And again, one of the, the job and life of a plasma cell 
is to make antibodies. And when a plasma cell goes from being a diffuse, there, there are many, many different types of plasma cells, many different antibodies made. But when a plasma cell it, it becomes a dyscrasia, it makes a single immunoglobulin over and over and over again. And we can detect that, and we call that a monoclonal protein. And I'll talk about the monoclonal protein in a minute. And there's also many different names for the monoclonal protein. So this is our enemy. This is the plasma cell. This is, at, at this point, this is a normal plasma cell. Um, this is the nucleus. This is where all the genetic material is, is, uh, is. And again, the job in life of a plasma cell is to make antibodies. And this large area outside of the nucleus, you can see on these two different uh, pictures uh, represents the area where the that cell is making immunoglobulins or antibodies, which is a protein. Um, and this is the this is the picture of uh, uh, this is a, a graphical picture of the immunoglobulin, and it's an, and there are um, a larger piece of the immunoglobulin, which and and whoops, um, there's a larger piece of the immunoglobulin. Um, which is paired, and, and that's called the heavy chain. And then there's a smaller piece of immunoglobulin that's called the light chain. So we'll often hear about light chain. And what I say, when I say light, a light as opposed to heavy, as opposed to the lights above. So when, we, when, you, when you hear the word light chain, um, you want it, it's part of the immunoglobulin. And I'll show this a little bit differently. So there are many types of uh, of immunoglobulins. Um, uh, there are uh, many types of heavy, the, the larger piece, heavy chain. The most common heavy chain in myeloma is immunoglobulin G, IgG. The most common immunoglobulin, the second most common is immunoglobulin A, IgA. And then there's uh, immunoglobulin M, IgM, which you, there can be myeloma, it's rare. Um, the, there's another disease, a, a similar disease that we take care of called Waldenbusch's macroglobulinemia, which is a disease, which is a non-plasma cell disease of IgM, and then rarely uh, uh, these others. And that's the heavy chain part of it. The light chain part of it um, can either be a cap or lambda. It, it, it's arbitrarily named cap or lambda. We could call it A or B. You could call it one or two, but it's named cap or lambda. And an individual's myeloma will either have uh, a kappa, will have one, will typically will have one of the heavy chains, uh, again, most commonly IgG or IgA, and one of the light chains, either kappa or lambda. There are some times that patients have light chain only disease, where because these plasma cells are abnormal, sometimes they can't make the fully functional antibody or immunoglobulin. And all they can make, all the plasma cell can make is the light chain. And sometimes we call that light chain myeloma. And so I get this question all the time from patients. They say, what type of myeloma do I have? And when they ask that question, I'm, I, I think they're, in a large part, they're asking this question. And, uh, and, every, and the vast majority of people will have some type of abnormal immunoglobulin or um, and it'll be in, and I'll say you have IgG kappa, or you have IgA lambda, or you have light chain only disease with kappa. Um, that's the that's in large part the type of myeloma. And I'm going to go here. No, I'll show you. Uh, and so we talked about um, this monoclonal protein. This, the monoclonal protein is that specific immunoglobulin made many times over. And so some people call it an M protein. Some people call it a monoclonal protein. Some people call it a paraprotein. Some people call it an M spike. When whichever, those all mean the same thing. So whatever you're used to calling it, that's what you'll, uh, that's what you'll call it. And so we, we, can, we, measure in, we can measure individually how much immunoglobulin is in, is in the body. Um, and in addition, we measure how much of the specific myeloma in, or plasma cell uh, dyscrasia antibody, and that's the paraprotein or M-spike or monoclonal protein. So normal plasma cells, the, the, the biggest genetic differences happen between normal plasma cells 
and an entity called MGUS. And I'll go in, and MGUS is a pre myeloma or pre cancer condition where there's clearly abnormal plasma cells. These plasma cells uh, under the microscope um, uh, look like myeloma, but there's not a, there's there's um, there's a, a small burden of them. And but the abnormalities that drive to myeloma occur here. The and there are this is where the uh, chromosomes get mixed to match. Mixed to match chromosomes are called translocations. But in a large part, we don't know why. We have some suspicions, but we don't know why normal plasma cells go on to MDES. And then uh, there's an, a, an additional transition, and this is a major transition of MGUS turning into cancer, turning into myeloma, turning into multiple myeloma. There's an enormous amount of study of asking why MGUS turns into myeloma. MGUS is a, 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 um, is a disease or finding where, a, where 1% of patients will then subsequently develop myeloma or related disease every year. So if it's 1% at one year, at 10 years, 10% of patients diagnosed will have myeloma. At 20%, 20% of the patients diagnosed will have myeloma-related diseases. And underpinning all of these changes from MGUS to uh, a, an entity called smoldering or asymptomatic myeloma uh, to active myeloma are changes that happen within the myeloma cell as well as changes that happen in the microenvironment and in our immune system. And so to d- the uh, and so MGUS is by definition is defined as an M protein of less than 3, again M protein, monoclonal protein, paraprotein, all the same, that plasma cells in the marrow less than percent and know what we call known of what we call myeloma defining event and I'll show you what a myeloma defining event is shortly. And then uh, smoldering myeloma is when there's a higher burden of disease. That is, there's um, the paraprotein has gone greater than three. There's 10% or more plasma cells in the marrow, um, but no symptoms of myeloma. No, none of what we call the myeloma-defining events. And then again, ultimately, multiple myeloma or myeloma is when you have clonal plasma cells you have a monoclonal protein, and you have what's called a, my, a myeloma-defining event. And so what are the myeloma-defining events? We, uh, there, there's uh, the, uh, the standard way, which we've been which we've used, used for many years, and then an updated way. And I say it's new, except that it's, we've been using it for now up almost eight years. So it's not that new. But the standard way, the older way, and we still use it, is what's called the CRAB criteria. We use the acronym CRAB. C stands for calcium, high calcium in body. R stands for renal, kidney function, uh, abnormal kidney function, or worsened kidney function. A stands for anemia, lowering of the red blood cell count in the body. And B stands for bone lesions. The bone lesions of myeloma are what are called lytic bone lesions, where where bone is taking, taken a, away from the myeloma and they look like holes in the bone. The newer uh, additions to the CRAB criteria um, uh, have, been, uh, in, have been developed and, and laid out by the International Myeloma Working Group uh, in, a, in a publication in 2014, says that there's a group of patients that we used to think had asymptomatic myeloma. That is, they didn't have any CRAB criteria. But they had certain features that were that were where these patients were so likely to develop myeloma very shortly that we as a, a myeloma community have decided that these patients need treatment, and hence we've identified these patients of having myeloma and we've initiated treatment. And is those patients whose bone marrow shows sixty um, so sixty percent or more plasma cells, those patients who have a significantly abnormal uh, light chain, and those patients who have what are called focal marrow lesions on an MRI of the spine and pelvis. Again, um, this gives you a a chart about who gets myeloma. Um, It's estimated that there's almost uh, 130,000 people living with myeloma. It is extremely rare before the age of 40. Having said that, 
I have, um, I have uh, I, the youngest patient that I've ever cared for uh, was diagnosed when he was 16. And I have a small handful of patients in their 20s. But as you see, the, the likelihood of getting uh, of, of the myeloma is much more common uh, in, uh, in older patients. Um, and the, the peak is in the, in the 70, in the, in the 60s and 70s. Again, we don't know why we, uh, uh, individuals develop myeloma. We don't know why plasma cells go from normal to abnormal. And then the, so there's an enormous amount of study there. And then there's an enormous amount of study of why once a patient has MGUS, why the, the MGUS goes from MGUS to myeloma. Those are, those are likely two distinct biologies that we're looking at. Again, it's, it's older, more, men more than women, uh, Black Americans more than white. Um, history of MGUS was a, a very high risk factor. And there's a lot of discussion about potential exposures, um, including radiation and certain type of environmental exposures. How do we make the diagnosis of myeloma? Uh, we do blood tests and urine tests because when the blood tests and urine tests are looking for evidence of CRAB criteria, um, we measure in the blood the calcium, the kidney function with, a, uh, with creatinine, uh, and uh, a, a complete blood count, including hemoglobin, which tells us whether a patient's anemic or not. Um, these blood and urine tests also look for how much of the abnormal protein is there. And we use um, tests called the serum protein electrophoresis SPEP, the urine protein and electrophoresis UPEP, and the, the, and the third test is uh, serum free light chain. We do a bone marrow biopsy. We, the bone marrow biopsy, we, we pull the liquid part of the marrow and that's called the aspirate. And then we take a small piece of the marrow and that's called the biopsy. We do tests like what a test called flow cytometry to see, to confirm that plasma cells are abnormal. Um, and, and, and typically these plasma cells, just like the light chain that is uh, being released from the plasma cells, is either a cap or a lambda. We see on the myeloma cell whether it's cap or lambda. There's, um, and then we do cytogenetic analysis. We look at the genetic material within the myeloma cell, and the and uh, the primary way we look at it with, is with a test called Fish. Typically, myeloma cells um, don't survive in a dish, and so we have to do this, uh, and so we can't do what we call conventional cytogenetics typically. The, the vast majority of patients my, with myeloma will have normal cytogenetics, but that doesn't mean that the chromosomes are normal. That just means that the myeloma cell doesn't grow in that test. So we have a, a, a handful of uh, you know 10 or 15 very common abnormalities inside the myeloma cell. And we can, and we can ask whether these abnormalities are in an individual's myeloma cell. Um, and, um, sorry. Um, and, so that, and so that's the test called the fit, uh, called FISH. Um, we're now, we now have uh, additional technology um, using uh, things like next generation sequencing and imaging tests. Historically, we've used what's called the, the skeletal survey. The skeletal survey basically it are regular x-rays of all the bones in the body. The good thing about a skeletal survey is that um, the skeletal survey is, is easy, it's inexpensive, and it shows, the it shows a significant amount of myeloma bonuses. The downside of uh, skeletal surveys is that they missed approximately 30% of the abnormalities uh, of lytic bone disease. And so now we've done more intensive imaging. Um, uh, most people would very much like to move towards what's called low-dose CT scan. Um, there are, uh, it's a very good test. It's a CT scan of all the bones in the body. And it's called low dose because it does not deliver a lot of radiation uh, to the patient. Um, the downside is, at least here in the United States, we have not figured out administratively how to do that test. And that's something 
uh, that a lot of people are looking at. Um, the, uh, we also do MRIs and uh, uh, PET scan or PET CTs, um, which both help understand my, both myeloma bone disease as well as what's happening inside of the bone marrow, particularly uh, with MRIs. Again, we talked about mono, I talked about monoclonal proteins. I will just reiterate monoclonal proteins. Monoclonal proteins are, uh, uh, again, the M protein, that's a measurement of how much of the single antibody is being released from the plasma cell. Again, monoclonal protein, M protein, M spike, paraprotein, all mean the same thing. There can be an intact immunoglobulin. When we see a, a light chain in the urine, it's called a, uh, a bench Jones protein. Um, in a large part, at new, it's not perfect, but at new, at when, when patients are newly diagnosed and relatively early in their course of therapy, the amount of the monoclonal protein correlates with the amount, the overall amount of uh, myeloma in the body. Later in the course of therapy, um, sometimes there's a disconnect between the amount, the, the disease burden in the body and how much of the monoclonal protein there is. How do we stage myeloma? Um, and staging in myeloma is very unique and, and it's different than other cancers. Other cancers like lung cancer or lymphoma, staging serves two purposes. Staging always serves uh, at least one purpose, and this is true in myeloma, and that's and that's the concept of prognosis. And um, prognosis is not how you how in any individual patient will do, but prognosis is how a group of patients who have similar findings uh, will do over time. And that's and that and staging works like that in myeloma. Other cancers, again, like lung cancer, lymphoma. Stage really drives how to treat the patient. There's completely different algorithms for how to treat stage one lung cancer than stage three and four lung cancer. In contrast to myeloma, um, the stage of myeloma has um, very specific, very little impact on how we treat. Um, how we treat myeloma. And, and again, this is a, a likely a point of debate within the whole myeloma community. But how we treat myeloma has much more is much more related to do we consider the patient has high risk disease or standard risk disease? Now, um, and I like to have broadly speaking two categories: high risk or standard risk. And I don't call anybody low risk because I don't think this is when when a patient has myeloma. There is I don't consider them low risk. Um, but standard risk or high risk. And when I say risk, it, when a patient has symptomatic myeloma, uh, myeloma, I'm talking about the risk of the myeloma coming back early and the risk of dying early from myeloma. And so stage um, helps us with that somewhat, um, um, but, we, but in a large part, we don't use stage alone for treatment options. And the, and the things that we need for stage are... Uh, uh, um, uh, a protein called the beta-2 microglobulin, um, albumin, the, a protein called LDH. When the LDH is high, it's a, it's a marker of a very fast-growing, and the medical term we use is highly proliferative, a fast-growing myeloma. And then the, the fourth thing we use is cytogenetics. And so staging patients, we use a combination of clinical features, which are defined by these blood tests, and what's happening inside the myeloma cell. And those patients who have, um, who have either the high-risk cytogenetics, and there's a handful of high-risk cytogenetics, in, the, in our staging system, there's, there's only three. The reality is that there's likely, there's likely more, and any updated staging system will include these additional ones. But the ones that were included in, in the revised international staging system are the 414 translocation, the 1416 translocation and deletion of 17P. Um, and so there's a, a combination of the clinical features and, uh, and cytogenetics. And um, at least when this study came out, uh, develop, uh, having this um, as, a, uh, as our staging system, 
the uh, um, 80% of the patients who had stage one were live at five years, 60% uh, at stage two were live at five years, and 40% of patients who had RISS stage three were live at five years. Um, with better therapies, uh, and, and, um, these all of these numbers are likely higher, but this is when they develop the staging system, these are the numbers that they have. Um, so the, the, how often do we test all of these values? Um, we typically, in the midst of treatment, um, we would typically measure all of these tests um, once uh, the, the blood test and the urine test, the blood test uh, once a cycle or once a month, the urine test that depends on the, if a patient has abnormalities in their urine, uh, and the, the radiology is at x-rays. And then, um, and I think that this is an area where reasonable people will disagree, but we, I, we, I certainly do it at diagnosis and that at confirmation of response. And once I've confirmed a response, for example, once I have a patient who has a normal PET scan and they're in a remission, meaning I can't detect any evidence of myeloma in their blood, urine, or bone marrow, I don't routinely check additional x-rays unless there are symptoms or evidence of the myeloma coming back. From a, a, the bone marrow biopsy, we would just certainly do a diagnosis. We certainly do it to confirm response and then when the patient has relapsed. All right, moving on to treatment. How do we treat patients? Um, the, the factors that we consider at time of diagnosis are um, the overall health of the patient, um, how the patient is doing. When I say how the patient is doing, what we, call, what see, we say it's called performance status. Some people say fitness. Um, we certainly discuss patient preferences. We look at how the myeloma is impacting the body. Does the patient have a, a, a abnormal kidney function? Does the patient have high calcium? Um, we ask the question, what's the risk status What's the of the patient? Is it high risk or standard risk? And we do all that and we come up with a treatment plan. Now, uh, this is an old slide developed by Dr. Shaji Kumar, Kumar but I, I still think this slide is relevant. And in a lot of times, we ask the question, is the patient transplant eligible or ineligible? And a lot of times that's asking, that's asking the fitness question. I'm sorry, we're having a crisis at my desk. I just knocked down half the stuff at my desk. So um, where it, that's, a que that's a question of fitness. But the, and then we do an initial therapy. And again, there's um, therapies, uh, um, uh, are two, dr three, and four drug therapy. The most common drugs that we use are lenalidomide, ortezomib, carfilzomib. Um, dexamethasone is almost in all of the treatments. Um, uh, uh, daratumumab or other monoclonal antibodies. And then, and then we ask the, and then we ask the question of should the patient go to transplant, and that's what we call consolidation. And then most commonly. After, after transplant and recovery, there's maintenance. For those patients who don't go on to transplant, um, after initial therapy, there is um, a, a combination of consolidation, ongoing initial therapy, maintenance, a lower intensity therapy, and continued therapy. And typically these are um, uh, nowadays uh, treatment as long as it's working and as long as somebody tolerates it. There's a lot of discussion around can we do treatment, a time-limited treatment? Um, and I think the concept of time-limited treatment is extremely attractive uh, to patients and physicians alike. I, I, I think that time-limited therapy represents the investigational therapy and the standard approach, the one that's associated with the longest remission duration, the longest survival, are the are uh, continue to be, are, are the uh, uh, ongoing therapies, and then you'll hear uh, Dr. Wiesel talk later this morning about treatment of relapsed disease, and we'll also hear a very important discussion about the about supportive care. But notice that supportive care is underpinning the entire uh, uh, time that a patient's under treatment. Um, 
So uh, I talked about combination therapy. I'm not going to go into the specific details of all the regimens. I think if somebody has questions, I'm all happy, I'm happy to ask, uh, happy to answer those. I'm going to spend a few minutes on high dose therapy. Radiation is used primarily um, in patients who have uh, who have very symptomatic uh, uh, disease, whether it's um, it, bone disease, uh, painful bone disease, or or, or um, that's not responding to our standard therapy, or or tumors of myeloma. Uh, again, that hasn't has not responded. We talked about smoldering. Um, the, there's a lot of discussion about smoldering, about whether smoldering or asymptomatic myeloma should be observed or consideration of prevention strategies. Um, and then um, there's always new and emerging therapies that we're looking at for treatment of myeloma. Um, there are the, again, the, the initial therapy for myeloma is goal is to drive the myeloma as low as possible. Um, there are oral medications, there are intravenous medications, and there are in, in, in medications given subcutaneously or under the skin. Stem cell transplant, uh, the, really the entire term should be considered high-dose chemotherapy because that's the business end of the transplant. That's what's helping the myeloma and then transplant. And so what we do with a, what we do with a transplant is we give a very a single um, well, before I talk about how we do it, who does a transplant? Um, we consider, and it's probably, while I say it first, it's probably the least important age. We consider um, how the, what is it high risk or standard risk myeloma? We consider how deep the, uh, how, how good of a response a patient's had. We consider the fitness or performance status of a patient. And finally, we consider what's called comorbidities. Does the patient have significant heart disease, lung disease, or liver disease? And so, so conceptually, for patients who are fit and appropriate, we will give a very high-dose chemotherapy. The goal of that very high-dose chemotherapy is to wipe away as much of the myeloma as possible. The side effect of that very high dose of chemotherapy is that it prevents the body from making blood and, it, and, and, and gets rid of the immune system. So before we give the very high dose of chemotherapy, we have to collect stem cells. And stem cells, it's probably not the, the best word to use, stem cells, or they're the, the cells in the bone marrow that make new blood and make new immune system. We get them out of the bone marrow by giving growth factor injections, the blood come the, the 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 stem cells grow in the bone marrow. They come into the blood, and from a catheter in the chest or neck, or possibly even IVs in the arm, the blood's taken out of the body. Um, it goes through an apheresis procedure where the blood spins very fast, separates out the white blood cells where the stem cells are. Um, that's taken away in this bag and frozen, and then the rest of the blood comes back into the patient. Um, then there's the actual treatment of myeloma. That's the chemotherapy. And this is old chemotherapy that has typical, what I call chemotherapy side effects, hair loss, low blood counts, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, um, risk of infection, single dose of chemotherapy one day, two days later, reinfusion of the stem cells. Um, and then you'll see here that after reinfusion of the stem cells, uh, sometimes the, the lowest point of the transplant is usually in the five to 10 day range. That's when the blood counts are lowest. That's when people have, could have a bad sore throat. And then 10 to 15 days later, the blood counts come back up. There's a recovery after that, after that period of time. Uh, and then that's uh, followed by uh, um, a reassessment of the myeloma in the body and then a maintenance therapy. And so again, getting back to the components of management of myeloma, um, the consolidation is the transplant. These are for transplant eligible patients and then maintenance. There's an enormous amount of discussion. There's re research that comes every year. Um, uh, there's an idea that our therapies are so good now, we don't need transplant. And every time that's been tested um, over the past uh, um, 25 years or so, we've gotten the same answer. By doing the transplant, 
patients stay in remission longer. Um, there's a lot of controversy about whether that then uh, has patients live longer, but it's very complicated because a lot of the studies that are done, if the patient didn't have the transplant early, they got the, uh, the vast majority of them would get the transplant late. And so none of the current studies are really asking the question transplant versus no transplant. They're asking the, the question of transplant early or transplant late. And every time it's been asked, should we do transplant early? It, it, doing the transplant earlier keeps the myeloma quiet longer. And, the, the, and, and when I say keeping the myeloma quiet longer, the medical term we use is that increases what's called progression-free survival. So if you ever see on any medical presentation, PFS, that's progression-free survival. That's keeping the, the myeloma quiet for long. And I'll just wrap up that in order to care for a patient appropriately, we have to individualize the care, age, risk, kidney function, lifestyle, where you live, how close you are, blood counts, what, what, what uh, it's called steroid status. Does, do steroids uh, really negatively impact your life? Um, um, patient, what you've had previously, and of course, um, this is always a conversation, what is the preference? And then, uh, and I, very importantly, um, uh, you'll hear later this morning about the important supportive care that we, we're not treating myeloma. We're treating people who have myeloma. And we have to think about that every time we make our decisions. Um, and, uh, you know, how do we, how do we get through well-being? Focusing on the medical, focusing on, on uh, staying active, uh, w working with groups like this for advocacy, um, and and uh, in participating in support groups um, and uh, fundraising because we're still working very hard in trying to care for people who have myeloma now and try to figure out for the next generation of people who have myeloma how to care for them. Um, and I'll I'll end there. And uh, appreciate everybody's attention. And I will be happy. Uh, I think we're all going to get together for a few minutes and answer questions. So thank you. Well, thank you, Jonathan. Um, I learned several new things, of course, on your talk. So always appreciative. Let's take this to our chat. And Robin Tui, our senior vice president, will be discussing the questions with the panelists. Robin, take it away. Hi, sure. Thanks, Kelly, and good morning, everyone. Thanks, Dr. Kaufman. I am watching the chat, and we've got some really great questions for Frontline, and I will try to go through and pick the most general questions, of course, that answer for everyone. So when you were talking about the testing, Dr. Kaufman, if the IgG tests are in the normal range and there's not an M spike, what causes that kappa or lambda ratio to rise out of range? And then secondly, is it affected by daratumumab or any other treatment? Um, okay, so I will, so it's possible. It's, so if somebody has typically, an, let's say an IgG kappa myeloma and the, and the M spike goes to zero, but there happens to be a, uh, a rise in the in the kappa light chain. Uh, I think I'm. This is. I think I'm answering this question. Uh, the main thing I would worry about that a worry there is that um, that this is myeloma, and I mentioned briefly that myeloma uh, could change, and sometimes myeloma um, uh, can stop making the somebody's regular intact uh, M spike. And they can have light chain only disease, and and that's certainly possible. And in a situation where typically somebody has an M spike, but it's not there, but have a rising light chain, I'd very much worry about. Um, uh, I'd very much worry about relapsed myeloma. And the second question of daratumumab with our modern test, because daratumumab itself is an <laughs> antibody, and it's a monoclonal antibody. And in the test that we use, the serum protein electrophoresis or SPEP, 
we can some we can see that monoclonal protein. It's very it's a very small level, but sometimes we can see it, and um, and and sometimes the dare two map abnormal protein is in the exact same spot on the on the test at the monoclonal protein at the at the patient's monoclonal protein. But the vast majority of time, um, a good reader of the SPAP can differentiate between the monoclonal protein and the and daratumumab. Okay, thank you. thank you. That was very helpful. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of questions about testing. And when you were talking about the initial testing, uh, can you could you talk a little bit more about uh, next generation flow or sequencing and then using mass spec up front and then throughout? Yeah, uh, great question. So we have uh, we, we have some participants who are not here for the myeloma 101 lecture. We have folks here for the myeloma 401 lecture. <laughs> so it's, um, all right. So mass spec, uh, I'll answer the second one first. Mass spec is a new and exciting technology. And I do believe that uh, we, as the myeloma community, will be heading this direction. It's a new way of testing the monoclonal protein, um, and it is more sensitive. It is more specific. It is uh, less time-consuming. Uh, more samples can be run in a small. We're using smaller amount of resources, so it's new technology uh, that's exciting. The other, so there. The other one, and, and it was sort of, I'm, I'm probably answering several questions at, at a time right now, I, um, is there are, there's something called next generation flow and next generation sequencing looking at um, MRD. I really didn't discuss a lot about MRD. MRD stands, people use it, can say one of two different ways to think about it is um, minimal residual disease or measurable residual disease. Using our standard test um, that, that, that can happen really in any hospital, um, we can detect as little as one myeloma cell in a thousand normal cells. And so we'll say somebody is in a complete remission or a stringent complete remission, and that is at a level of we can detect about one myeloma cell in a thousand. Things like next generation flow cytometry or next generation sequencing can get down to the level of testing about one in a hundred that one myeloma cell and a hundred thousand normal cells or one myeloma cell in a million normal cells. So a patient can be in a complete remission but have but have varying amounts of disease below the level of standard injection. And so now with our most sophisticated technology, the next generation sequencing, we can see as little as one myeloma cell in a million. And so if somebody has less than one myeloma cell in, a mil in, in the equivalent of a million normal cells, then that patient's considered MRD negative, minimal residual disease negative or measurable residual disease negative. The other way we use things like next generation sequencing is getting a little bit more knowledge about the, what's happening inside the myeloma cell. When we do fish testing, we're looking for five or 10 or 15 different abnormalities in the myeloma cell, whereas something like next generation sequencing can detect the, the thousands of abnormalities that happen within a myeloma cell. And again, but only a small handful of those are likely going to be what I call clinically relevant, some things that we can use to help patients. Okay, Dr. Wiesel. So just to add on to what Jonathan said, Jonathan, fantastic presentation. Good to see you. Um, Thanks, Thanks. <laughs> Just to go on about next generation sequencing, because in the future, we're hopefully going to have individualized precision medicine based on specific genetic abnormalities in any individual patient. <clears throat> One of the pathways to getting to that point is by next generation sequencing. Right now, next generation sequencing can not only tell you about MRD, but it can also look to see if you have any specific mutations of your myeloma DNA. And at some point in the future, when you have specific mutations, let's just say you have a mutation called ABC, we'll have a drug, if you have an ABC mutation, we'll have a drug against ABC. Right now, the, there are a number of mutations that could be picked up 
that we don't really have drugs for, they're in development, we don't really have drugs for KRAS, NRAS. Um, there are drugs that are out there that are being investigated against specific mutations in individual patients with myeloma DNA. But ultimately, 10 years from now, myeloma treatment is going to be very, very specialized and being using, using technologies like next generation sequencing to guide the treatment we give that individual patient. Thanks, Dr. Riesel. That's really great. And I, I see, Dr. Verena, you're nodding your head. Do, would you like to add in anything there? No, I definitely agree with both Dr. Kaufman and Dr. Riesel. I think as we move further and we learn more deeper in what myeloma does, yes, specializing patients and not just giving them a broad stroke chemotherapy, you know, do the flash and burn and see if it works, um, we'll have more success. Um, and I think it's actually true that, you know, every patient is individualized, just the way Dr. Kaufman said, that there's many treatments out there that are available, but it's what best fits the patient itself. Great, great. So I'm also seeing now some questions with using daratumumab in frontline. So some of the questions, and I'll try and consolidate these. So daratumumab in frontline, would that be used for a fixed duration or until disease progression? Who's going to go for it? Jonathan, you got it? Yeah, that's, yeah. So um, typically, when um, well, daratumumab, when used as part of therapy prior to transplant, that it's used in combination with other therapies. It's used for a fixed duration prior to transplant. Um, and, um, and so if it's used outside of transplant, um, in those patients who we deem aren't eligible for transplant, um, typically, the, at least the studies were to stay on daratumumab as long as it was working and as long as it was tolerated. Um, and, and, so I, and so the answer to it is it depends on the situation. Um, it, I have a small handful of patients who uh, are on, uh, who are on, who we are considered transplant candidates, who for whatever reason don't move forward to transplant. And in those situations, I would use dare to map and dare to map combinations for a fixed period of time. Um, and um, so I'd be very interested in to see uh, how, uh, uh, how David, um, you guys approach using dare to map up front if you do it all. So we are, for non-transplant eligible patients, we keep them on continuous therapy indefinitely based on the Maya trial. They have, even in five years, we haven't reached the median progression-free survival. So this is fantastic data, uh, giving Dara RevDex, let alone thinking about down the road of giving four drugs, Dara VRD or Dara KRD. And not only that, the Dara RevDex, they have a significant number of these MRD uh, negative patients, which is a good thing. We're not big advocates of giving the four drug regimen for transplant eligible patients, the DARA combinations as we found, and I bet you you may have seen this as well, that it does impact negatively somewhat on stem cell mobilization. And we are big center in consideration of tandem transplant for ind certain individual patients. And we've actually had some problems collecting sufficient cells by giving the four drug regimens upfront um, plus there's the data from the Casapia trial saying that if you get there, I don't want to confuse people on the call. Um, Jonathan knows what I'm talking about. Maybe Daniel as well. Um, we're not big and upfront for transplant eligible. I don't think that's going to change anytime soon for transplant ineligible. It's continuous therapy. One of the questions was, can, if you've had Dara before, can you get it again? Well, if you get it continuously, there isn't getting it again. You just stay on it. But if you had DARA up front and then had a transplant, there's probably no reason you couldn't get DARA again when the disease came back. Okay, DARA, Ryan. by the way, is not, DARA's not the only one of the anti-CD38 monoclonal antibodies, just to be fair. There's a cousin drug or twin almost called Sarclisa or Isotuximab that um, is only approved for relapse setting. It's not approved for upfront yet. Uh, but there was some very impressive data from the German group 
and our recent national, international meetings of giving ISA VRD similar results as DARA VRD. So that is another option is to give Sarclisa instead of Daratumab. Sarclisa right now only comes IV, whereas Daratumab comes both as a subcutaneous injection as well as an intravenous formulations of which 99.9% .9 of our patients are getting it subcutaneously. Great, great responses. This is really helpful. Dr. Verena, anything to add to that? Uh, yeah, so I think at our center, um, we tend to, uh, there's a lot of studies in the elderly population, so over the age of 75, so we used to do VRD light. So we're looking at, even for the ineligible patients, giving them actually a four combination, adding DARA plus VRD in a VRD light setting. Or patients that are even eligible, like Dr. Wiesel said, we may do a four drug combination up front, and like Dr. Kaufman said, and then move them to transplant, and then they may not see the DARA after it. So yes, we do more upfront DARA. To kind of comment off of what Dr. Wiesel said, I don't think at our institution we've had too much trouble actually getting stem cells collected, um, even if patients were exposed to DARA prior to harvest. Um, I think in earlier times when DARA first came out, we did have a little trouble, but somehow um, I think we've given them a little bit more window of time off from the drug over four weeks, and we were able to collect them. Okay, so lots of, I think a follow-up here, uh, if we move on a little bit, but still in the same realm of questions with transplant and upfront and then post-transplant, so what multi-drug post-transplant maintenance therapies would you consider in high-risk myeloma patient? And then also, currently, would you consider using multi-drug post-transplant maintenance therapy in standard-risk patients? So I'll, I'll write this one first, and then uh, Daniel and Jonathan can pitch in. Standard of care is lenalidomide revlimid for maintenance therapy after transplant. There are four, as, as people know, there's four randomized trials showing that revlimid is better than observation after autologous transplant. All four of them show an improvement in progression-free survival, how long they stay in remission. Only one of those trials showed an improvement in actual overall survival. So, and similarly, only one of those studies showed that Revlimid actually improved high-risk patients, the MRC trial. The other three did not show any benefit to Revlimid maintenance in high-risk patients. I personally was starting to give a proteasome inhibitor, one that's an oral proteasome inhibitor called Minlaro or Exasimib with Revlimid for my high-risk patients. And I was doing that up until the American Society of Hematology meeting in December when the Spanish group actually did a study of induction therapy, transplant, and then they randomized patients to Revlimid dex or Revlimid and Laro dex, thinking that giving a three-drug regimen after transplant was going to be superior, particularly in the high-risk group. It didn't pan out. So I've actually dropped my Ninlaro from the patients who were on RevDex. Uh, Jonathan, I know, has data where he, which I'm sure he's happy to share with us on VRD and high risk patients and the outcomes with that. I am not convinced that we've made a great impact more than a few months with any post transplant maintenance therapy in the high risk patients. Yeah, so we have for a long time we've been using uh, the the combinations, um, and then recently there was a randomized st uh, study done by the Italian group called Forte um, that showed that compare that looked at uh, Revlimid maintenance, which was standard, and versus Revlimid plus uh, Kyprolis or Carfilzomib. Um, and it looked like the it looked like that there that patients who had Carfilzomib had better, the myeloma stayed away longer. So that it was actually for everybody, but we don't use it for everybody because uh, we don't, ex that the, the high risk patients are I think the ones that are the most likely, the, the ones that need the benefit. So we're doing the combination in high risk patients, but understand that um, this is one of those areas where 
reasonable people who could disagree about looking at the same data. All right, Dr. Verena, any any follow up on that? No, I agree, and I, I do agree with even uh, Dr. Wiesel in saying that that yes, we don't really see much improvement with patients at high risk, even post transplant. So Revlimid Dex does very well. I think in our institution, if patients still had some high risk characteristics, like even in the the Maya trial, um, adding daratumumab to Rev Dex, we've actually put patients back on. Dara RD post transplant um, for usually about a year or so, and then begin to reassess whether they still need the Dara or not. Up next is David Biesel, the John Thor Cancer Center at Hackensack University Medical Center. David, I've known you for a little bit. You've done hundreds and hundreds of these for us, and I appreciate you being here on a Saturday morning. So take it away. My pleasure, Kelly. I, I really enjoyed the opportunity to interact with my medical colleagues, but more importantly, to interact with the patients and their families. It, it's really what uh, we should do as we get older. We uh, want to be able to share some of our you know, learned wisdom with, with uh, the people that we care the most about. So at this point, we're going to talk about relapse disease. Um, I will tell you before I start my first slide that when I've been doing myeloma for 32 years. And when I first started doing myeloma care back in 1990, the average survival was two and a half years, two and a half years, folks. And now the average survival, depending on what stage you're in and what your genetic risk stratification is, can be 15, 20 years or more. Didn't, we would never even, even thought it was possible back in 30 years ago that, that we would have patients that could live 15, 20 years or more with control of their disease. So with that as a background, on this presentation, we're going to talk about different options in general, sort of like what Jonathan did. I don't want to go over individual patients and what's the best regimen for this person versus that person. It, it's, as I told you before, it's it's individualized to that individual with or without what I mentioned with the next generation sequencing. You still have to, it's not like some other cancers, each myeloma patient really needs to be treated uniquely based on their own characteristics. We're gonna talk about that. We have to talk about what may or may not influence that decision process. We're gonna talk about what's new. We're gonna talk about what's really exciting on the horizon. So you've already seen this basic slide, and we've talked about this actually in the question and answer period. Patients who are transplant ineligible generally stay on whatever treatment they, stay, they start on, they're supposed to stay on. So I'm gonna give an analogy now that I want people to appreciate. I've got two analogies in my talk. The first one is, why do we keep people on therapy? Why don't we stop treatment? And this is in the transplant ineligible ones, the transplant ones on maintenance, or in the relapse setting. So if you, when the disease comes back, we treat you with drugs A, B, C, we don't stop them. So let me give you my analogy that I, I think that is kind of self-explanatory. Think of cancer as a car and not a car T-cell, which we're going to talk about later. But think of cancer as a car on a hill. So what happens if you don't put the brakes on a car that's sitting on a hill? the car rolls down the hill. You put the brakes on the car, the car stops. You take your foot off, you stop therapy. If you take your foot off the car, off the brakes, the car starts rolling down the hill again. The problem with myeloma, which we're gonna see in the subsequent slides, is the brakes eventually wear through and you have to get new brakes put on to stop the car from rolling again. So the whole concept is, is to keep your foot on the brakes, not let the gas or the car roll down the hill because the patients will continue to relapse and progress if you stop treating. So induction therapy followed by continuous maintenance therapy, induction consolidation, maintenance therapy continuous until disease relapse. So we need some definitions here. Relapse disease just means the disease has started to act up again. That protein, the M protein, the SPEP, the monoclonal spike, however you define the free light chain ratio, however you define it, it starts to get worse. 
That's called a relapse. When you have a refractory relapse, it means you're progressing on treatment and it's a, it's a more significant indication of disease, ref, uh, badness in the disease, if you will, because you're progressing on a treatment, then you have to change treatment. So relapse just means disease comes back. Refractory means you're not responding to that regimen at all. We have to change it up. So this diagram, this cartoon here, is to explain why we don't cure myeloma. And I'm going to give you another analogy here. Think of an eight-lane highway. And on that eight lanes, you've got cars in each lane. You've got a Peugeot. You've got a Porsche. You've got a Tesla. You've got a Honda. You've got a Volvo. They're all going down the hall, down the highway. They all have, they all cost different. They all have different motors. They run at different speeds. They're all kind of going down the highway. Some of them are going fast. Some of them are going slow. Well, we treat the patient. Let's say we have a blue Honda. We, the blue Honda is out in front of the rest of the group on the eight lane highway. We treat the blue Honda and we stop it in its, in its tracks. We give it VRD chemotherapy. The blue Honda stops. That's a good thing. We keep our foot on the brake, so we keep them on the VRD. Unfortunately, the brake lets up, the blue Honda takes off, and let's say we give them KPD, just another combination of letters, and we keep them on that until the car you know, gets stuck, and, and, it keep, and, and then you have to come up with a different regimen. But meanwhile, while the blue Honda is going down the highway, oh my God, the red Cadillac decides to take off. So you have to come up with a different drug regimen for the red Cadillac. You treat the red Cadillac, and what do you know what happens next is the green Tesla takes off. So we have this continuous clones or different cars or different myeloma clones that are coming and going at different times, and not all the drugs for, work for each one. And that's why we never can completely stay ahead of the eight lanes. That's why we don't cure the disease. So we're going to give you a, a history here. So Johnny B, Johnny B. Good, is a 65-year-old male. He has early-stage myeloma. He got VRD chemotherapy. He, just, he had a transplant, didn't want to go on maintenance therapy. That was his choice. And three and a half years later, his M protein goes from zero to 0.6, that bad protein that the myeloma cells produce. The question is, should we start treating him? His x-rays don't look bad. His kidneys are okay. He's not anemic. He has no problems with his calcium. He just went from zero to 0.6. There's nothing else going on with Johnny B. Well, I decided, you know, he's asymptomatic. Let's just sit on him. Three months later, he's 0.8. Do I need to jump up and down and start treating him? Most people would. I bet Jonathan and Daniel's group probably would, at this point, would probably do it. I'd probably say, eh, 0.6 to 0.8. Everything else looks good. Sit on him. Six months later, it's only 0.9. I guess I made the right choice. I didn't do anything. But then he goes from 0.9 to 1.5. And I go, you know what? Even I'm getting nervous now. I think he needs to be treated. So the issue of when to start treatment is also individualized. So there are people that just have a blood test abnormality, don't have any other symptoms. Some of those people can just be watched. And that's what it shows in the first one. But that being stated, those patients who have very short remissions, so let's just say Johnny B had only one year after his transplant, his protein went from zero to 0.6, that shows he has very aggressive disease. I'm not going to wait till Johnny breaks something before I'm going to treat him. So if he doesn't have aggressive disease, they don't have high-risk disease, they might be able to be watched. That being stated, the contrast, con contra, uh, the con contrast point is if they do have high-risk disease or aggressive disease, you probably should start to treat them earlier, even if they have a biochemical relapse. And of course, it's a no-brainer if they have those crab symptoms that Jonathan talked to you about. Any one of those, and the patient needs to be treated, doesn't matter what the protein levels are. So we have been blessed that even though myeloma is only a little less than 2% of all cancers, it is a very, very productive product line and drugs that have been approved in the last 15 years. If you look in the last 15 years or 18 years, there's 15 drugs, actually 16 now, 
because a second CAR T-cell just got approved three weeks ago. We've had, I think, 16 drugs in like 18 years in a disease that's really uncommon. And this is the timeline of drugs that have been approved since 2000. And we are really fortunate to have these. Now, that being said, the ones that are in red, I don't know if you can see my arrow or not on the screen. The ones that are red, panabinostat and melphalan fluthenamide have just been withdrawn from the market because of companies decided they didn't have enough market because the efficacy of those two drugs was questionable in the clinical trials. And they actually withdrew those two drugs from the market just in the last few months. So two of them have been withdrawn, not because of increased toxicities, but lack of superior efficacy, and the companies just decided it wasn't worth it to them to have those drugs available. So when someone relapses, this is just a, a chart showing all the different things you can give people. You can give them a pomalidomide or pomalis-based regimen. Look at all the things you can give with pomalis. You can give them Kyprolis regimen. Look at all things with Kyprolis. Darzalex. And the list goes on and on. You're going to be like, well, how do you decide what to do? And you actually have to rely on the expertise of the individual treating you. And it's actually for that reason that I highly recommend, and yes, I work at a myeloma center, but I highly recommend that myeloma patients, whenever possible, should see a myeloma expert to help guide their private clinician on what's the best option to treat that person. Doesn't mean you have to get all the treatment at the myeloma center, but I really think that everyone should make an intense effort to see a myeloma specialist. You know, the, again, it's less than 2% of all cancers. How do you expect a local oncologist who spends 90% of their time dealing with breast cancer, lung cancer, prostate cancer, colon cancer, to know about a drug, a, a disease that they see five to 10 patients a year? So I can only strongly recommend that you try, if at all possible, to see a myeloma expert. So these are all some of the, the choices available. Some of the newer drugs on available are the one on the end, Expovia or Selenexor is now approved as a single agent, it's approved with Velcade. You can get it based on a thing called the NCCN guidelines, which I'm gonna show you in a little bit, with Pomalist and with Darzalex. And then there are the, the new guys, the BCMA-directed therapies. There's two CAR T-cells, which we'll talk about at the end. And then there is a BCMA-directed antibody that's got a nuclear bomb attached to it that also is effective in myeloma, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. So rather than give everyone biology lessons of different modalities of how these drugs work, let's just say that they work by a variety of different mechanisms. The best way to treat myeloma is to come at it from multiple fronts. So the reason we went from two drug regimens to three drug regimens to now four drug regimens, it means you have four different ways to attack the bad guy. And the more ways you, you can attack the bad guy usually results in more bad guys dying. And that's the goal is to kill off the myeloma cells. And if we can combine different ways to attack that cell, we're going to be better off. That stated, someone may say, well, you're giving all these drugs. What about the side effect profile? Well, most of these drugs, unlike melphalan that we use for transplant, and Jonathan went into very nice detail that melphalan just like kills indiscriminately. But most of these drugs mainly have side effects or, or mainly have directed activity just against myeloma and don't have a lot of bystander effect. So I won't say there's none, but there's very little bystander effect that the neighborhood cells where these drugs are, atta are attacking are going to damage other parts of the body. So these are more precision type medicine that uh, attack not almost specifically just the myeloma cell. So when you think about somebody's relapse, this, all these different balloons are different things we have to think about. What's the age? What was their previous therapy? Did they tolerate the previous therapy? What are their genetics? What's their kidney function? What were the side effects they had before? What do they have pre-existing problems besides uh, kidney function? Do they have heart problems? Do they have neuropathy? All these things come together to come up with an answer to what's the optimal treatment for any individual patient. We talked about this already, about Johnny B. The slide on the left is patients whose 
proteins are just slowly climbing and you sometimes could wait and may not want to possibly not treat them as aggressively. But standard of care for first-line therapy and relapse is at least three drugs. There are individuals, very frail, elderly individuals, renal insufficiency, I might give two drugs to and almost never give a single agent, almost never. And that's in contrast to those patients who have rapidly growing disease, those that have high-risk genetic uh, abnormalities, they need to be treated with this multiple different therapies to attack different mechanisms in killing the myeloma cells. And we already went over the slide. Let's not do that again. And we actually went over this as well. Uh, frail elderly patients can tolerate um, three drugs. Most of the times, you know, you heard Daniel talk about VRD light. Um, Dara Revdex is very well tolerated. Most of the drugs that we treat myeloma patients with can be adjusted to the individual so that they actually can tolerate most of the time triplet drugs without a lot of negative impact on quality of life. Obviously, quality of life is the key. We want patients to have longer lives, but we want patients to have good quality of life during that improved duration of their lifespan. There are certain drugs you want to avoid. People with renal dysfunction, Revlimid, for example, has to be dose adjusted. Some of the other drugs may need a little, Pomalist uh, needs a little dose adjustment, then Laro needs a little dose adjustment. Patients that have peripheral neuropathy, you probably want to avoid giving Velcade to. Patients that have heart disease, you may or may not want to think about carfilzomib or the carfilzomib dose level you want to give them. So again, it's mix or match. I showed you that variety of combinations. This is another one. I'm going to show you two more slides uh, on combinations. You get initial therapy, usually a triplet, possibly a quadruplet. If you have a transplant, most people go on maintenance therapy. When you relapse, second-line therapy, there's this long list here of DARA-based therapy. There's another monoclonal antibody. It's a tuximab I talked about. Arsoclitha is a first cousin of DARA. There's another antibody called Implicity or Elotuzumab that is active in combination with Revlimid and uh, Pomalist. Uh, you could go on an all-pill regimen, which is probably the easiest to get, which is Ninlaro Pomalist Dex or Ninlaro Revlimid Dex. Also kind of the runt of the litter. It's the most convenient. You only have to come in once a month, but also has probably the lowest efficacy. And then unfortunately, patients will relapse from that, you can switch in the same category or subsequent therapies are shown on the right-hand side, including down at the bottom, Belantamab or Blenrep, Idacel is a Becma and Siltacel is Sintaki or Sintalki or something like that. It just got approved with its new name. Um, these drugs are approved, which we're gonna talk about in just a little bit for patients who've had four or more lines of therapy. So let me just give you a lesson in myeloma counting. If you get VRD transplant Revlimid, that's only considered one line of therapy. That's one, even though you just said, I just named three different treatments, we consider that one line of therapy. You have to have four different cocktails of therapies to be eligible to get Blenrep or a CAR T cell at this point in time. Someone's already asked, are these going to be, some of these drugs will be moved earlier in the disease course? And the answer is going to be yes, but not right now. Melflufen is off the table, got withdrawn. So what do we do at relapse? We want to get the disease under control. Even in the relapse setting, there is a, a goal to reach this MRD, minimal residual disease, or measurable residual disease in those patients. We want to get to that point without negatively impacting their quality of life. We obviously want them to live longer. So we want to control their disease. We want them to have good lives and we want them to live longer. And everyone would agree that that's a, a highly desirable goal. The other day, just for example, I saw an 88 year old individual who's on Dara Revdex, Darzelex Revdex frontline therapy, been on it for three years. The guy goes, so what, what, uh, what's going to happen with me? I said, well, you're 88 years old. You're not going to die from myeloma. 
I'm not going to tell the individual you're not going to die. You're not going to die from myeloma. You're on first line therapy. We've got all that list of options available to you. Myeloma is not going to be the issue. And if that's actually the case, we sometimes refer to this, th this type of situation as a functional cure, that the disease is not the thing that's going to be the end result of their lifespan, that it's going to be some other event or some other complication of their life as we get older, and they are, quote unquote, functionally cured because they're in remission at the time that they pass. This is another slide I'm assuming, um, and I'm sure either Robin or Kelly can uh, verify this. I'm assuming you guys are eligible to get copies of our talk and hopefully um, the oral presentation of our talk. But this is another picture of a cell and all the different mechanisms of the way drugs work to kill myeloma. And this number keeps increasing almost on a every couple year basis. We've got two or three more drugs that should be approved in the next two to three years. I'm not gonna go over those drugs. One of those is called venetoclax. The other one is a drug called ibertamide. Venetoclax has a very unique mechanism, the way it, it messes up cell um, enzymes and machinery. Ibertamide is kind of a cousin, first cousin, if you will, of Revlimid and Pomelist. It works sort of in the same mechanism. Should get approved, I think, sometime in the next two to three years. So we're going to have at least two more drugs approved in the next uh, few years. So this is our toolbox. There's a lot of tools in the toolbox, or I usually say it's the toy chest. I got a lot of toys in my toy chest. Um, commonly used drugs are first relapse. If you've been on Revlimid maintenance, often you'll give something like Kyprolis, Carfilzomib, Pomelist. If you've just were on Revlimid, and dexamethasone. Some people may pick Darzalex, uh, Pomelis, dexamethasone for first relapse. I personally, um, if they have high-risk disease, and Jonathan can add his opinion on this, for high-risk patients, I give Darzalex, Kyprolis, Dex for first relapse. For patients who have less aggressive disease, I'll give Darzalex and either Pomelis or Revlimid and dexamethasone for first relapse. So I kind of separate out high risk versus low risk, and give a proteasome inhibitor instead of an imid for first relapse. The issue is, though, whichever one I don't give then for the second relapse, I'll give them the other drug. So if I gave them DRD for first relapse, I'll give them KPD for subsequent relapse. Ultimately, you get all the drugs. And if you think this all sounds confusing, there are 21 institutions that make up this group that's called the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. And they meet, I think, at least twice a year. And they come up with drug regimens that they consider that are recommended for treatment. That does not mean necessarily that these are FDA approved, but almost always Medicare will cover what the NCCN says, even if it's not FDA approved. And if Medicare approves it, the private carriers approve it. So when you look at patients Previously treated for myeloma, one to three prior therapies. Look at this tremendous list for one to three prior therapies. This is why it's advantageous to see a myeloma specialist to pick out which of those of this multitude of options is best for you. And then when you look at patients who've had more than three lines of therapy, again, it's not as long a list, but there is certainly a, a growing list of drugs that are approved for patients who have more than three lines of prior therapy. Ultimately, we run out of tools in the toolbox or the toys in the toy chest, but we have a lot of different options in the toolbox and the toy chest for you. So let's talk about what's new, hot and sexy in, in myeloma, if you will. And this is immunotherapy or immuno-oncology. And this involves a variety of different immune type approaches to treating myeloma. I'm gonna cover the one that's the least developed first, and that's vaccines. We've been trying to find a vaccine, forget COVID, three, four, five, the number of immunizations you may need, that you can make antibodies against specific proteins, just like you can make antibodies against the COVID spike antigen on the COVID virus. You can make antibodies against myeloma proteins. 
still a work in progress. I've been working with vaccines for over 25 years. There's still not a vaccine that looks like it's a, an absolute winner. But that is one way to do it, to try to generate a vaccine against the myeloma cells themselves. IMIDs, immunomodulatory drugs, which are Revlimid, Pomelis, Thalidomide, and soon to be Ibertamide, do work through different mechanisms, immune mechanisms with the cell to enhance their immune effect, to try to get the immune system to kick in more, um, to overcome um, the myeloma cell growth. Monoclonal antibodies, most of you have heard already about Darzalex, Sarclisa, Implicity are the three out there right now that most people are aware of. And then there's a relatively new one, it's been out for about two, three years, called Blenrep, which we're going to talk about a little bit more. But it's another antibody that's made in the laboratory that is, has activity against specific targets on the myeloma cells. And of course, all of you have probably heard about this. Hot, and hot topic of CAR T cells, which we're going to talk about in just a moment. So one of the proteins on the myeloma cell is called BCMA. So think of a myeloma cell as, this is another analogy, think of a myeloma cell as sitting in a neighborhood of homes. Well, each home has a different color. They may have different colored uh, roofs, they may have different items in their yard, but each house is maybe a different color. So let's just say you have a house that's blue, you have a house that's red, you have a house that's white, you have a house that's green, all in the same neighborhood. Neighborhood is the myeloma cell, and on top of the myeloma cells are these different colored houses. Well, you can make an antibody against the blue house, you can make an antibody against the red house, you can make an antibody against the green house, and those antibodies will attack the houses. So BCMA is one of the houses. It's the greenhouse. There's a CAR T cell there is a green. So it's a greenhouse, so we can make antibodies or we can make generate cells, the your immune cells against that house. There are other drugs, such as uh, Darzalex, which attacks the red house. Amplicity attacks the, the blue house. So there's different colored houses, and you can have different antibodies against those houses. The one that's most popular right now is this one called the house, the greenhouse, called BCMA, which stands for B-cell maturation antigens expressed on all myeloma cells, very little expression on other cells in the body. So when you make an antibody against this greenhouse, it really has minimal, minimal, minimal effects against any other cells in the body. And we're going to talk a little bit more about these other aspects here, because this is using the BCMA. There, you can have CAR T cells that attack BCMA. You can have antibodies that attack BCMA, antibody drug conjugates, and you can have bispecific antibodies. We're going to talk about each of those different technologies in just a moment. So when you look at different drugs that are either approved or in development that are attacking this greenhouse called BCMA. This is this list of different ways to attack them. Antibody drug conjugates, which I'm going to show you a specific example, this belantamab mafodotin or Blenrep is a antibody drug conjugate. What that means is you have an antibody that has a nuclear bomb attached to it. The antibody attaches to the greenhouse the nuclear bomb is right there. It blows up the house. So an antibody drug conjugate means you've got an antibody, you've got a chemotherapy drug attached to it that kills the cell. Bispecific antibody is, think of a, a fork that you have prongs on two ends, okay? So you've got one fork, prongs on two ends. One of the prongs sit, sticks into the green house, the BCMA house. The other prong sticks into one of your immune cells in your body. So it brings your immune cell into close proximity to this greenhouse. So you've got an antibody that's attacking the greenhouse and you've brought, because you stuck the other end of the fork into the immune cell, you've got the immune cell that also attacks the greenhouse. So that's why they call it a bispecific because it's got two different prongs. It uses, it uses two different mechanisms to attack that greenhouse. CAR T cells, I'm going to cover some of those in more detail in just a moment. 
Um, but but they also most of the CAR T cells, with with one exception, all attack greenhouses. There is a CAR T cell that attacks the red house. It's still in clinical trials. None of those are approved yet. So this is the blend rep. Again, it's got here's the bat, the myeloma cell. Here's your greenhouse, the BCMA on it, and then over here is the drug that's going to be attached here. It says ADC. There's going to be a drug attached to the antibody, and it's going to attack both by the antibody itself and by the drug attached to it. So it's a double whammy. Does this work by itself? The answer is yes. You get about a 30% response rate to this drug by itself. It's given IV. It's given every three weeks. It essentially has no side effects, except it can affect your vision and your eyes transiently. It's not permanent. It's very uh, alarming to some people because they say, oh, I've got, it feels like I grit in my eyes. I can't read, I can't watch TV as well. This is a temporary problem. It can be mild, moderate, severe, but that is the main side effect. And it's from the chemotherapy. It affects, it affects the cornea of the eye, the chemotherapy drug that's attached to the antibody, but it eventually wears off. When you give it, that's by itself. You can give it with pomalist, and look, not 30% small study, 34 patients. But when you give it with pomalist, it, the improvement in the response rate in this small study was 88%. That, that's really, really impressive that you can get that kind of response in combination with this drug. And yes, it does cause these ocular or eye effects. It's very common. Almost 80% of people, 78% of people will have some even if it's mild effect on their eyes. But when you look down here, only 3% of the people actually had to stop the drug because they, the toxicities were so great. Didn't mean they were permanently blind, don't get me wrong, but they had to stop the drug because of side effects. What is CAR T cell therapy? This is the, you know, the hot, hottest kid on the block. It's taking your own, it's different than stem cells. When you have a stem cell transplant, as Jonathan eloquently described, it's really relying on the chemotherapy. The stem cells have no bearing on whether the transplant worked. The stem cells is just to get your bone marrow to grow again. CAR T cells is completely different. You're taking out your own immune cells, your own immune cells, and you're modifying those cells to do two things. The first thing you're doing is you're making them very angry. So you're giving them you know, attitude, if you will. And then you're make, not only making them angry, but you're, you're arming them with missiles. And the missiles are directed against the greenhouse. So you, give the, you make these cells angry, you give them missiles against the greenhouse, you give them back to the patient. They can attack by multiple mechanisms to kill the myeloma cells. So these cells, uh, hopefully will last a long period of time. They'll kill all the myeloma cells. And again, all myeloma cells have greenhouses on them. And this is the process. They collect your cells similar to what they do, uh, similar machine as when they collect stem cells. You don't, get any, you don't get any growth factors. You don't get any chemotherapy. They just hook you up to the machine. Three to four hours, they collect the cells. They take them to the laboratory takes, it says 17 to 22 days, it takes about four weeks, which is something we'll talk about in just a little bit. It takes about four weeks for these cells to get angry and to arm them with missiles before they're ready to be given back to the person. You do get chemotherapy to suppress your immune system. We've now changed your own cells. We've genetically modified your own cells. And we don't want you to, even though they're your own cells, they don't look exactly the same. So it's sort of like they, you had blue eyes going into the collection, and now we made, the, made you have green eyes. We don't want your body to reject those cells. So you get three days of therapy so to suppress your immune system so you don't reject the cells, your own cells that we're going to give back to you. We give, them, give you back these cells. It's a simple infusion. And then we follow you generally now for 10 to 14 days in the hospital. We're gonna talk about why in just a second. Now, one of the main issues with CAR T cells, there's two CAR T cells that are commercially approved. 
One of them is called a Bekma, the other one is called Sin 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 Bhakti or something like that. Um, from Janssen. They both are made, the way they modify the cells is they use a viral vector. They insert this virus that's genetically modified into the cells and those, that's what causes the cells to become angry and to arm the cells with missiles. There is a shortage of the viral vector. Think of real cars. It's hard to get a new car off the car lot because there's not enough chips to make the computer parts for the cars. Well, there's not enough viral vectors to make enough CAR T cells for what's the demand. So right now, many institutions don't have this availability of the commercially, uh, they're approved by the government, but they just don't have allocation to those sites. Our center is a larger center and Jonathan can, and Daniel can talk about their centers. We are allowed one patient a month. We have a very long waiting list to get people CAR T cells. We have to select which one's going to get their CAR T cell each month because there's this very lengthy waiting list, mainly because there's not enough viral vector generated to make the CAR T cells. So keep that in mind when people say, well, why don't, doesn't everyone get a CAR T cell? And the answer is right now there's a shortage of the vectors. You can't get them. So you get this collection, you get the cells generated, they're generated in the laboratory, we give them back, we infuse them, and then we wait for them to work. And what happens is we, again, we've made these cells angry, we've given them missiles, and you know what happens? They're really angry and they say, well, we're gonna grow like wildfire. And when the cells rapidly expand, they produce a lot of hormone-like substance we call cytokines. And these cytokines can do a, num a variety of different things. So we call it cytokine release syndrome. And this is mainly from rapid expansion or rapid impact of those cells in your body. It could be that because they're growing so fast, it could be because they go right to work and start killing bad things. But this happens that you get this cytokine release syndrome. This is why you're in the hospital happens one to five days after the infusion, depends on which product you get. The Abecma is one to two days. The Janssen product is a, a few days later than that. It can cause fevers, high fevers. It can cause flu-like symptoms. It can cause low blood pressure. It can cause low oxygen. And it can cause uh, problems with your kidneys as well as with your lungs. There are very, very good ways to counteract this with an antibody called tocilizumab, or we just call it tosi, or with steroids. This is very transient, lasts a few days. It's rarely, rarely, rarely reversible. This is different than a transplant. There is no nausea, there is no hair loss, uh, there's no GI toxicities, but you do have the, the potential, which we're gonna show you the details in just a little bit, of getting these uh, cytokine release syndrome. In addition, it can cause transient neurologic compromise. It could cause problems with difficult speaking. It can cause, uh, I've seen people be semi-comatose. It can cause some thinking impairment. It can cause seizures. And there are very good ways to control this as well. And this is much rarer than CRS. Again, I'm gonna show you the data in just a moment. So there's no free lunches. These can happen. They're not very common. And that's what's shown on this slide. These are some of the different CAR T cells out there. I just want to talk about the two that are approved. Silta cell, this is the one that just got approved February 28th. I want to show you 97 patients. Response rate was 98% of the patients responded. These are patients who've had four or more lines of prior therapies. In fact, the median number of prior therapies was six. They had six different cocktails of alphabets. 98% response rate, 80% complete remission rate. CRS, to get any type of things, most of it was just flu-like symptoms or fevers, was 95%. Very In this particular study, any tox, neurotoxicity was 20%, but only 10% had any significant neurotoxicity. This one's approved. The second one that's approved is IDASEL, which is a BECMA. Let's actually use this one because it's a larger study. 
The six was the median number of prior therapies. Response rate, it was 75%. If you look at the difference, the complete remission rate was 30%. And this particular one, CRS, was fairly common. Again, neurotoxicity in this was also present, but significant neurotoxicity was low. These are temporary for all practical purposes. So these are people, some of these people were at the very end of their options available to them, 98% response rate, 75% response rates. So one of the problems with these, besides the fact that they're not available, is that um, there still is no plateau on the curve. We still don't think any of these patients are cured. Could you get these drugs earlier in the disease course? There's lots of studies giving them first-line therapy and first relapse and so forth. It's not going to be available in any of those settings for three to five years, but the answer is yes. Will that mean transplants will no longer be necessary? The answer to that is probably no. That The chemotherapy used for transplants still an effective therapy. So we have these two CAR T cells, a BECMA, Carvicti, I can't pronounce it, approved here. Again, there's for people with four or more lines of therapy. So no, if you've only had two lines, you can't get it. And even if you can get it, most places have waiting lists to get on them because of the vector shortage. By specifics, we talked about the, the fork that has two prongs. This is the mechanism tumor cell. This is an immune cell. You bring them in the same proximity and then they work better. I just want to cover by specifics. There's a variety of by specifics out there. This is the response rates. Again, this is an antibody. It's an IV. It's given either IV or as a shot. It's given either once a week or every two weeks. But when you look at the response rates, this is the response rates. Look, 80, 60, 70, 60, 70, 65. These by specific antibodies can be given immediately. You don't have to generate any cells. They're gonna be off the shelf, if you will. Do these antibodies, because of the immediate activity, also cause CRS? The answer is yes. There is the same CRS, the fever, the flu-like symptoms that you may get with these antibodies as well. And right now, these antibodies are, at least the first doses are given as inpatients. Neurotoxicity with the antibodies is much less than what we saw with the CAR T cells. And this is, again, kind of a summary slide, overall response rates of these variety of antibodies, 65, 80, 63, 83, 70. These two on the bottom called telquetamab and sevastamab. This one does not, these all, the antibodies all attack the greenhouses. This one attacks a pink house, and this one attacks a chartreuse house. So there's different bispecifics. They don't all only use the greenhouse for a target. There are different targets that have bispecifics to be made for. CRS varies between the different ones. So when you look at cars versus bikes, this bites are bispecific. T cell engagers is what bite stands for. Is it apples versus oranges? Advantages, they get deeper responses, and for right now, it looks like they last longer with the CAR T cells, and you're off therapy. You get one dose of the CAR T cells, you're done. By specifics, though, you have to keep getting repetitive treatment of those. Advantages of bites, you can get them immediately. Once, once they become commercially available, you just order them just like you do any drug, and you don't have to wait. You don't have to put people on the machine. You don't have to wait till they're cells grow. There is an off-the-shelf CAR T cell where they're actually taking CAR T cells from donors that you'll be able to order. It's in clinical trials, not commercially available. They'll be able to take these CAR T cells and just order them you know, like you would any drug and administer them to people. But those are, are in development. There's a couple companies. Allergene is one of the companies and Selectus is another company making off-the-shelf CAR T cells. Oops. Clinical trials, all of us are in academic-based settings. Everyone should be considered for clinical trials. If we didn't have clinical trials, we wouldn't have all these new toys in our toy chest. 
These are some of the new drugs. I mentioned them briefly, the metoclax, ibertamide, the bites, the bispecific drugs, other CAR T cell therapies. There are websites you can get, the clinicaltrials.gov lists all the clinical trials in the world. And then the IMF has a myeloma matrix that you can access clinical trials. Um, this is just going over again, all the new drugs we've had just since 2015. Look at all these drugs that are available. We are making major advances in the treatment of the disease. We want remissions to last. We want patients ultimately off therapy. MRD is going to be very important to us in the future. If you become MRD negative, can we stop the drugs instead of what I told you before about keeping your foot on the brake when the car's on the hill? Maybe we can, if we have a good enough combination, the brake's going to stay on without being treated with drugs. That's what we would like, get people off therapy. And of course, ultimately, we want to cure the disease. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you for your time and patience. Well, thank you, David. That was amazing information. And I remember starting this 20 years ago, 19 years ago, going, I think they asked me to talk about thalidomide. So I am thrilled to see what's happened in 20 years. And you really nailed it. Now, we got a couple, couple of questions here. I'll leave it. We're going to do it kind of brief because we're running a little bit over. Robin, will you pick the, some questions out of there for David? Sure, absolutely. Again, thanks, Dr. Wiesel. Amazing, positive progress, and, and it is exciting to see how far we've come over the years. So we've got lots of good questions in here. One, there were a number of comments that thank you for explaining the lines of therapy and how that works. So you could be on, like you said, multiple lines, transplant, maintenance, that's one line. So that helps people to understand just how far along some of these patients that have been on three, four lines of therapy. So with that in mind, speaking about the lines of therapy, if a patient is on a three-drug therapy and then relapses, how is it determined if the patient is re refractory to that specific combination or is it one of the drugs within that therapy? So if you're on three drugs, the disease is getting worse, you're refractory to all three drugs. You don't, it's not one of the drugs because they work together. Hopefully, the reason we give three drugs is twofold. One is they have different mechanisms, as I told you about. You want to attack the bad guy in by three different modalities. But in addition to that, sometimes you get one plus one plus one equals four. So some of the drugs not only attack individually by a different mechanism, but sometimes they're, it's even enhanced when you give the two the drugs together. So, but if you're refractory to the three drugs, to a K, KPD, you're refractory to all of them. I mean, that's that's the mentality uh, of, we don't generally use those same drugs. I won't say never, we generally don't use those same drugs again, unless you actually think one plus one equals three type of situation. All right, okay, great. And then kind of staying in this role of the CAR-Ts and the bi-specifics, uh, where do you envision bi-specifics and CAR-T playing for the future uh, in frontline versus transplant? That's a great question. Um, I, again, I don't think transplant's going to go away because high dose melphalan is still, besides uh, the... Uh, the Janssen CAR T cell, the high dose melphalan is still the most active single treatment for the disease uh, compared to anything else. So I don't think that that's going to go away. I'm not sure what the future is going to hold as far as sequencing these drugs. And I'm not sure my colleagues have an answer to that either. Um, it's really up in the air. We don't know if we should think about, uh, just for an example, I'm going to throw this out there, four drugs, induction, auto transplant. CAR T cell maintenance therapy for someone with high risk disease, just as, as, as throwing something out there as a hypothetical that you'd be giving all the different modalities we possibly have. And for either the concept, and I'm not sure what my colleagues will say, whether you can kind of cure people that have minimal disease at diagnosis or in the high risk situation to give them everything we possibly have to control their disease longer. So I, I really don't know how it's all going to be sequenced. I'm going to turf to Jonathan and Daniel. 
Yeah, I think you. Um, I think you're. First of all, uh, thanks. Thank you for the talk. Uh, I have new analogies that I will use, so appreciate it. Um, um, I think you're exactly right. We don't know how we're going to incorporate this. Um, we're. I think there's a lot of people out there, including our group, are having the discussions of how can we incorporate all of these extremely potent therapies earlier in the course of therapy to get very deep remissions, time off therapy, and maybe a significant fraction of patients, not operationally cured, but cured. And I, I don't say that, I, 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 I'm not saying that's going to happen, but I think that's the conversation that's happening in the myeloma community. Um, and, um, because we now have such potent therapies, um, and, but you're exactly right. We don't know where the future is in terms of how they will be sequenced. All right. We're almost out of time for this segment of questions, but I think this one is pretty important. Um, do you think we'll be able to minimize the length of hospitalization or the stay near a myeloma center due to the cytokine release or, or the neurotoxicities as our experience increases? So the answer is yes. The companies are making the bispecifics. I can't speak so much about the CAR T cells. The bispecifics are doing what we call step-up dosing. They're giving like a little bit the first day, a little bit more the second day, and uh, possibly one of them actually has two step-up uh, regimens to it a little bit more the third day to try to avoid this rapid killing and the cytokine release syndrome to ultimately make this a uh, viable alternative to be done as an outpatient. I don't think the current generation of CAR T cells is going to um, be able to avoid some form of, of it. If, if not uh, hospitalization, you're gonna have to be within, you know, minutes away from an outpatient center. Uh, the most common thing, the most common um, toxicity is just a fever, 101, 102, don't necessarily have to be hospitalized to have that managed, but you've got to be either centers that have outpatient transplants probably could do this. Um, the neurotoxicity, even though it looks like it's bad, is really very minimal. It's usually nothing worse than, you know, their handwriting is a little bit, uh, uh, off a little bit, or they, they may just be a little bit slow in answering a question. This is not a major uh, consideration or concern for, for those of us who do CAR T cells. So I think that by specifics, we're going to have step up dosing to try to avoid the acute CRS effects. CAR T cells probably are not going to get around that anytime with, with this generation, but could be done in centers that do outpatient transplants. Okay, that wraps up our questions, Kelly. Yeah, David, thank you so much. Um, both you guys have just really got a great talk going on. With all that being said, I wanna get into one of my favorite topics too, how to manage myeloma symptoms and side effects. Dr. Verena, I am a nurse leadership board member. You will have some great topics here to speak to. Dr. Verena, will you take it away now? Thank you so much, and um, thank you to the IMAP to uh, do this program for today, and what a great honor to be with Dr. Kaufman and Dr. Riesel. I think kind of wrapping it up or being the caboose of this train um, is really to kind of sum up what we've talked about with Dr. Kaufman and saying, really, what are the best treatments up front? Again, specifying quality of life and really symptoms, and then ending with Dr. Riesel, looking at what is available in relapse refractory patients, but also, again, as he even highlighted, what is the best quality? What are the side effects that we're seeing with our patient population? So I really wanted today just discuss, oops, is really, you know, we're going to talk like briefly about really how framing your decision making. And I think like Dr. Wiesel has been only doing, you know, myeloma since he was four years old. So he's 34 now. Um, and, you know, I've only been doing this for a few years, you know, last 20 years. But really, we used to patients, I would say, said doctor knows best. And I think really the new paradigm or really understanding of caretaking is looking at patients and saying, you now become the center or the driver of some of the decision-making process and be a key factor. So it's important as patients and caregivers to be really knowing who's your, who's your team, who's there around you. And like Dr. Riesel and Dr. Kaufman said earlier, 
you know, it's good to come to a myeloma center to understand the options that they have and that we are able then to help support and educate our community uh, physicians, oncology, hematology physicians. So yes, having a generalized hemo hemonc physician is very important. Understanding also integrating your primary care physicians. A lot of times our patients then turn to us as we become their primary care physician, plus their hematologists and their endocrinologists, but really staying in touch with those patients, those physicians are very important. But then on the other hand, there's also your key subspecialties. You have your nurses, your medical assistants, your social workers who are key help with all other psychosocial support networks and definitely having the IMF and other organizations out there to help support or questions or even having support group chats. I think it's important and not to be afraid as caregivers and as patients to ask questions. And there really isn't any odd question I think any of us have ever heard because every question a patient or caregiver asks, it's a new question for them. It might be a, re a question we've heard, but you've never asked it or heard the answer. So please always ask the questions that are on your mind. Be participating, write things down when you're at home. I think those are important because I've done that too, where you want to ask a question, you walked away and 10 questions came to you. So write them on a paper and then bring them and have them ready for you. I think it's important as we talk about the shared decision-making and, and there's a lot of data that we talked about today on the clinical trials and the research that's out there, which is the best induction therapy? What are the what are the next best uh, treatments for relapse or refractory to be uh, to be chosen? Is you know really be able to have the time with your physician and saying you know I may need a little more time to talk about what's available. Know that there's other resources out there, and there are there are websites that are available to look at the clinical data of different combinations and the drug e efficacies that we see now and understanding the, the uh, side effects of some of these drugs, which we'll talk about later on in this, might be there. I also think you know, asking physicians their personal experience with a certain combination of what they have seen, and to even if they needed to ask for a second opinion from another myeloma specialist, there's nothing wrong with that. I think it's also from our point of view, from the healthcare provider and from the patient perspective, we also wanna know each, each other's goals in, in the therapies that we choose, whether it's first line, second line, or your 10th line, what are your goals or what are your, what are your concerns or what do you wanna to get to that may have to impact the type of treatments that we have that maybe an all oral regimen might work best for you because you have to work full time or is coming to the cancer center easy or is it distance or travel? And we're gonna talk about financial toxicity later on and that does play a bigger part. So having this open dialogue is extremely important upfront. So I always say color of the wheels of treatment, treatment options, side effects, and symptom management and supports is absolutely true. I mean, I do love Dr. Wiesel's um, analogy with the greenhouse. I think that really nailed it down when talking about what targeted sites that we have for our myeloma treatments, but really looking at the colors of what we have in our galleries of, of myeloma and supporting our patients and their goals is what treatment uh, myeloma treatments are there, what's rapid and effective disease control. We also wanna know the durable disease control. How long can I keep the disease away? What's the depth of the disease, disease, disease quantity I can get to? What treatments are the minimal side effects I may have? And I think also what's important is what is the quality of life? I think it's important to know you know, if, if traveling is something important to a patient and their family, is that part of their quality of life or, or is it not inconvenient to them coming back and forth or overall survival? I think supportive therapies are very important and I think there's so much more out there, whether it's, it's psychosocial support versus some type of medication, but preventing disease or treatment of relative side effects, we have to look at. We have supportive care for bone strengthening, optimized symptom management, like doctor, like both of them had said today, most most treatments do have some type of side effect. With there's no perfect drug that comes with 100% no side effects. But how do we manage these side effects to minimally make quality of life improvements, or how to keep our patients on the drugs longer or the treatments to deeper their response on for their disease? And that's what I think we need to look at going forward. So I think we've seen this slide now, this is the third time I'm managing our treatments. 
But as you can see, like there were two choices, right? In transplant eligible, there's always initial therapy in front. And then there's a split looking at transplant, transplant consolidation or just consolidation to maintenance. But if you look at the bottom where it says everybody, everybody should be having supportive care, you know, whether it's psychosocial medication um, or group, group interaction. But I think that is our common foundation of all medical treatment um, is your supportive care. So really talking about, and I know we've brought it up a few times, we've talked about types of transplants, but we talked about CAR-T, I and mean, we also talked stem cell transplants. I just kind of want to bring it into, because there are some differences or nuances of what types of support that we may need, and there are different shades, and I love this, I was going to say 50 shades of you know, myeloma, which is really like the spectrum of it, but really shades of autotransplants, there's really no black and white answer to undergoing transplant. And I think even Dr. Kaufman and Dr. Wiesel had elegantly spoke about it earlier today, whether somebody chooses it or what, what makes them eligible or ineligible. We, we say fitness is actually very important, not age, because people at 65, people at 70 could do dances around people who are 30. So age really doesn't become uh, a cutoff date as much, but something that we do need to look at. Undergoing transplant is a commitment from the patient and the caregiver or their partners, understanding it's a big journey. I think cancer is a journey for both anyway. The diagnosis applies to both the patient and the caregiver. And there's a lot of data out there that says, you know, she has prostate cancer or she has myeloma when their husband does because they both share some of that responsibility and their, and their care is given differently. So both are, have to be very integral in, in the process of the stem cell transplant. And understanding the process will help bring them elements needed to decide whether they want to go for it or not. Sometimes it's a personal choice. Sometimes it's a financial choice. They may not be able to take the time off from work that may be necessary, whether it's one to two weeks or three months out of not being able to work because of the transplant or all the processes that have to be done prior to getting to that. So understanding, looking at us, and I just say us as the patient's part of that team, the clinical experience of what we see in transplants and their efficacy, the data from the research that we've seen, and we've both talked about it multiple times in the two talks earlier, that doing transplants more upfront, it's not gonna disappear. And looking at patient preferences makes it a wholeheartedly decision for the best on both ends. I think I'm, you know, just to breathe very quickly, Dr. Kaufman also showed this process of what happens with the stem cell transplant patient when the transplant is right for me. The patient goes through their induction therapy. They will have their stem cells, a CD34 count, those special stem cells collected. Um, they go for transplant. They may either get consolidation treatment after their harvesting, depending on the patient, or then go right to transplant. The stem cells, we call it day plus zero, are given back to them after conditioning therapy. And then about two to three weeks after the stem cells are infused, the patient is discharged home. And then they're actually back down to getting some type of reevaluation at day plus 90. In some institutions, everything's a little bit different, but most patients should, you know, could get a bone marrow biopsy, some type of radiological scanning, whether it's an MRI or a PET-CT, 24-hour urine and uh, blood work, which helps gives us the best picture of the success or the depth of response from that particular transplant. Again, like we said, upfront allotelic transplants remains the standard of care for eligible patients, absolutely, and we know that. But again, it's a commitment and understanding that there might be some changes in their lives or some quality of life changes that have to be considered at the time of, change, at the time of transplant, and even knowing some of the restrictions that might happen after those transplants. But so we look at transplants by number, is eligibility, right? We walked in the door, is everybody eligible for a transplant? You know, is the measuring treatment response, will it be effective? Determining transplant is insurance authorization. We live in right now in the world in 21st century in financial toxicity. You know, not every insurance now covers everything. What's the burden on the patients and is there enough of support, financial support through organization help uh, defer some of those extra costs, right? Collecting the stem cells is also a process. It's not a one-day deal, similar to what we talked about with CAR T-cell. It may take like one to three to four days to actually collect it. And sometimes it could take a hospitalization 
if a different uh, mobilization chemotherapy was given prior to that. Stem cells are also collected in special hospitals, so bigger academic centers. So it might also require patients then to come long distance to an academic center that might be able to do this for them. Phase two is looking at, oh my God, did I just go through puberty? Phase two is looking at high dose chemotherapy. So the day of transplant, right? We give them high dose chemotherapy, mouth lamb, which we have mentioned, and a lot of supportive care. Uh, medications during that time to the time what we call engraftment when the bone marrow starts to regenerate and gets robust enough so that we can actually send the patient home. This could take up to two to four weeks in the hospital stay. Some centers do offer outpatient uh, auto stem cell transplants, but again, that's up to your healthcare providers, the institution, and your insurance if that is actually uh, a viable idea. And then what happens post-transplant, right? That's your time after you're discharged to day plus 100, right? You're re-strengthening. You get very fatigued. Fatigue is normal, but after transplant patients do tell us that they are very fatigued post the, the transplant itself. So really day by day and week by week, hoping that their strength gets better, encouraging them to eat healthier because hospital food, we all know, is not the food of choice. And there's no Uber Eats to a hospital. So basically, once you leave the hospital, it's getting that good home cooking that really helps our patients regain their strength. Again, doing that day plus 100 uh, assessment and beginning, again, a discussion with your healthcare provider and their entire team, what's the best maintenance therapy? And duration of this could take from 10 to 12 weeks. And ho But hopefully, you're home during this entire time of recuperation. Oh, my. Oops, I'm so sorry. There we go. So kind of looking at the, the general and really kind of bundling what we spoke about earlier this morning with induct with upfront therapy and at relapse, looking at the care support that what we can give again across the spectrum of all treatments, whether transplant or ineligible transplants, right? Sometimes educational sessions need to be given to patients and it's constant. I think education is always a key to help decrease anxiety in our patients, understanding what their needs are, being able to talk to them multiple times in many different ways. Some people like things in writing, some people like a video, some people like a pamphlet or something to read. So knowing how the best mode of, of learning is for each patient and the caregiver really becomes an important factor to that. Some transplant centers allow this outpatient and allow continuous care. So I think that's all as one big team that we have to look at. Oh my God. So let's look at what we can do for our patients. And I also look at uh, supportive care as this patient reported symptoms, but as healthcare providers, as a group, what can we do? And we do know that symptoms do affect our patient's quality of life. And we know that. So symptoms can be managed. So what are some of them? We have fatigue, physical fatigue, constipation, pain, neuropathy, impaired physical function, I think, and sexual dysfunction. I think that's something that sometimes isn't as highlighted or spoken about openly enough, but I think sexual health is extremely important in patients and their caregivers and the discussion with your healthcare providers. The, I think the diagnosis of cancer brings on the many depression and anxiety. It also may exasperate patients who already have a history of depression and anxiety, but something that we need to keep a close eye on and be able to give support where it's psycho, psycho, uh, social support or medication support to help them. Learning how to get the sleep disturbances, whether it's from steroids or not, decrease cognitive, decrease role or social function. I think once we're very hot, before the diagnosis, you're a very active patient, you know, knowing what you can and cannot do, and then having your treatments might debilitate you or change your social ability. I mentioned earlier, and we're moving on, that we really financial burden is huge or toxicity has really affected patients in cancer care. The burden is 80, approximately 80% of patients have some type of financial burden and the financial toxicity is enormous. Side effects of treatment, and we can cop, you know, copulate them also to patients with uh, stem cell transplants. Many times diarrhea can occur from other treatments or even medications we take on the side antibiotics, antidepressants, other uh, health supplements can give diarrhea. So knowing what these are, 
we can actually say cut back on them. Antacids for GERD or heartburn sometimes have magnesium, which may induce um, some type of diarrhea. So how to avoid it? Don't drink a lot of caffeine or carbonated or heavy sugar um, beverages. And there are other medications, right? There's Imodium, there's Lomotol, there's fiber adding Metamucil or even medications well called. Constipation is also a big thing that may happen because it's treatment, it's treatment driven. Some, some of our chemotherapies can cause constipation. Some of them also, some of the pain medications or the anti-nausea medications we give can also cause um, constipation. And being on vitamin D, which is important, or vitamin B12 also may also do it, but many of us are also vitamin D deficient. Nobody goes in the sun anymore. So how do we help that is really having good fruit, well-balanced diet. I always say fruits and vegetables, high fiber. I say it, don't do it, but I say it and everybody should do it. And again, putting Metamucil in there is very helpful. Pain, pain prevention, I think, and even pain management. Patients present, uh, a good percentage of patients present with some type of bone pain. I'm so sorry, my thing got a little excited present with many uh, bone pain, whether it's from uh, some type of pathological fracture or a lytic lesion, or sometimes even pain may be caused by the treatments themselves. So if they have lytic lesions and, and stuff, we can try to help prevent more bone disease by giving them bone strengtheners to decrease their risk of fractures or new fractures, but make sure that they should have dental clearance prior to having these medications given because some of them may cause um, osteoporosis of the jaw and antiviral medications um, to help prevent shingles because patients also may um, develop uh, herpes zosters. Some of these medications reactivate the herpes zosters and may develop shingles. If, bone, if there are procedures that have to be done, including a bone marrow biopsy, some institutions do offer some type of sedation to help lessen that pain or anxiety. And again, also looking at other Eastern kind of thoughts and meditation. We had a meditation session earlier today, but mind-body meditations and acupuncture and activities to help some of those alleviate. Peripheral neuropathy can be a presentation of the disease itself, but it also can be from some of the therapies that we give. So that's that numbing, tingling, the prickly sensation. You know, some people describe it to me like they feel like they're they're always having socks on their feet if they're wearing if they're barefooted, or they feel like they're walking on bubble wrap. They might feel a burning like a burning sensation on them. That can also be you pre can kind of be decreased by changing the mode of giving a bortezomab sub Q. It gives it less and less frequency. Um, massaging the areas with cocoa butter regularly. Sometimes talking also with your healthcare provider, maybe adding a B complex or adding folic acid to them that also might help decrease some of these symptoms, but also make sure that, that you're not taking the folic acid or amino acids on the day of the uh, bortezomab injection themselves. But again, the most thing I can push and, and, and emphasize the strongest in this conversation with you today is saying that you need to tell your healthcare provider every symptom you have. Do not be afraid to say, I feel more pain or I feel the neuropathy is getting worse because you're afraid that, he, that we may stop the therapy itself. It's better for us to change your therapy, you may have to decrease the intensity of the therapy so that your quality of life and the symptoms may be reduced because some of these symptoms also might be more permanent. Last but not least, fatigue, anxiety, and depression um, can occur in, in many of these, just even having fatigue, 98%, almost 99% of patients report some type of fatigue. It can be from pain, anxiety, insomnia, from a lot of the steroids we give, that people don't get a restful sleep, some of the toxicities, and the bone marrow suppression. Anxiety and depression also kind of go hand in hand. Pain causes anxiety and depression, and depression and pain and depression and anxiety also increase or cause pain. So they kind of go hand in hand, and it may also decrease patients' quality of life and change their also their social or sexual activities. So again, talking this out with ourselves, the healthcare provider, even with the caregiver, and bringing in other specialists that might be able to help uh, support you through this. I know it's been tough in the last two years. We've all lived through a pandemic. And really, what it says, relaxation and good health is important. And I think that really is 
important to stress. Getting health, adequate sleep and rest is extremely important. I don't think any of us on this panel really understand that yet, but we think it's important that you do have good sleep, have heart, because lack of sleep or not correct sleep can have heart uh heart-related um, instances of death, increased anxiety, worsening pain and fall because of cognitive. We're not as aware when we don't have the best sleep. We don't, we're not always thinking as clearly. Make sure that we're not taking drugs like steroids or stimulants or herbal supplements that may also um, cause insomnia. Sometimes taking steroids in the morning. Um, Sometimes patients feel that's better. I've had patients on a personal note say they take the steroids late at night because when they finally kick in, they're wide awake in the morning. But again, all this is to discuss with your healthcare provider. I think sleep hygiene, do not read or watch TV in a bed because your bed is for sleep and sleep only. Don't become the TV in the bed. When you want, if you can't sleep, get up, go to the couch, watch TV. When you get tired, go back to the bed so that the body knows that bed is for bed and sleeping only. If you need sleeping aids, discuss it with your healthcare provider because they will help guide you on what is the best sleep aid that might help you because some of them may also be cognitively impairing. Don't drink a lot of caffeine or nicotine or sugar or alcohol. They can be stimulants. Large meals are especially spicy or greasy foods before bedtime and also computer screen time. I know we're all obsessed with the iPhone, iPad, or tablet, but put it away because that blue glow actually can disturb your sleep. So yes, it's at your side of the bed, it's face down, but the body still sees it. Last but not least, and I know I'm also out of time as always, um, living with uh, bone strength, you know, stress management, relaxation, I think going to groups, having somebody to talk, Getting involved with the nutritionist or exercise also helps with better management of stress and mental health. Weight, weight gain or weight loss is something to talk about, but good, healthy activity, staying active as best as possible. That's why talking about your neuropathies or bone pain or any instances is good so that we can manage it better. I spoke earlier about bone prevention is important. So health screenings are important. You should be seeing your primary care doctor for mammograms, your prostate exams, all your proper screenings you need to see. Uh, stop smoking if you're smoking. Um, I know we always say that, but I think it's important. Dental care treatments, steroids can risk put risk for even dental cavities. And the drugs that we give can cause osteoporosis of the jaw. So seeing your dentist every six months for good cleaning and filling and keeping that healthy, right? I can only say as much, I could say on a personal note, I don't drink enough fluids. I don't know if everybody else does, but really drinking a good amount of uh, fluids like water, um, not just caffeine or juices. Um, avoid toxic medications if you have renal insufficiency, um, even especially keeping your diabetes under control because that can be very dehydrating and irritating to the kidneys. Again, knowing your bone, vitamin D, making sure your uh, vitamin D level is good because everybody has SPF and everything and we're all vitamin D uh, deficient. But, oh my goodness, I can speak fast. Final, I have two minutes. I know Dr. Kaufman's like, yes. Financial burden um, is huge in, in, in the United States, I think even systemically, pandemically in the world. So really what's the medical cost, the premiums, the co-pays, the travel expenses? You know, a lot of us come from big academic centers in kind of small city areas, but a lot of centers are out in air, regional areas that patients are traveling two, three hours just to get to them on a daily basis. So incurring those costs, medical supplies, prescription costs, things that sometimes as healthcare providers, we're not always aware of. And a lot of times patients don't also bring them uh, very forthcoming with a lot of their financial uh, burdens that they may have or restrictions. So again, be very honest with the healthcare team, allow a social worker to step in and be able to help you manage some of this and be able to get in touch with some of, of foundations that might be able to give financial support. Um, and maybe we can come up with alternatives that might be less costly um, or change some of the burdens. There are federal pharmaceutical supports, non-organizations, and there's a, a ton of websites, as you can see on this slide, um, that really can bring support to our patients. So to end this, two minutes late, but to end this is to say you're not alone. And I, I, I've been doing this only for three years because I'm only six years old. So, oh. but to understand that, to understand that we as healthcare providers here 
And at the IMF, we're here to support you and your caregivers. And we're here to also support ourselves. Dr. Kaufman and Dr. V are also my, my, my mentors. I look to them when I go to conferences to see what their advice is too on what's the best treatment. So we're all here to help each other. I thank you for the time. We thank you for your time. Daniel, that was a great presentation. Next, I want to make sure you guys, uh, we're going to do a little question and answering thing uh, situation here. I want to get, Robin, are you on? I'm here, Kelly. Why don't you pick a couple of questions there? They're all really lengthy uh, for the panel, as it were. Sure, of course. And I just want to do a real quick reminder first uh, that the slides and the entire replay of this program are going to be up on the IMF's website. There were some questions on that. And there was a question, Dr. Wiesel, we love the analogy for the car T's and the red Cadillac, the green Tesla and keeping the brakes on. But there was a question about, could you clarify the greenhouse analogy? Can I clarify the greenhouse? What, what? So there were there was a slide when you were talking about the greenhouse. Maybe if we could have uh, go back to the slides. And I think it was your reference to the BCMA target, uh, BCMA. Oh, and the so, greenhouse. So BCMA, BCMA. I just made the BCMA the greenhouse versus one of the other targets. It's just a protein on the surface of myeloma cells. It's present on all myeloma cells. There's no, there's no actual greenhouse on the, on yeah, the myeloma cells. Yeah. But it's just a, an example of the different proteins that can be expressed. They're called common determination antigens or CD antigens uh, on some of the cells. And this is a BCMA antigen. It's just, it's, it's just a protein on the, on the surface of the myeloma cell that has a lot of different uh, antibodies and CAR T cells that are targeting that specific protein. There are other proteins on the myeloma cell that could also be targeted. It's just that, that that's the one that the majority of the CAR T cells and the majority of the bispecific antibodies are targeted. Yeah, these, these are great. Thanks for the explanation. It helps us to draw a picture in our minds of when you do these analogies. I think it's, I think it's really helpful. So we've got some good questions here. So one came in for the doctors, if there is no overall survival benefit to maintenance and there is ongoing financial quality of life and other toxicities for maintenance, why stay on maintenance or continue to prescribe maintenance, especially Dr. Kaufman, you talked about younger patients being diagnosed and I think you said someone as young as 16. Uh, so, I, I, that's an excellent question. I mean, firstly, I, um, there, for the data that we have available, there is a survival advantage for uh, lenalidomide or Revlimid is used as maintenance therapy after transplant. Um, and, um, and so, um, I think that there's a lot of investigation into the question of how long does maintenance need to be given. Um, and there are ongoing uh, studies where overall survival is the primary endpoint. So, so we'll answer the question of using combinations, asking the question of daratumumab with, with Revlimid versus Revlimid alone, and then using the MRD testing to see if it's safe to stop uh, maintenance in patients who are MRD negative. Um, the study that we looked at, the, the Forte study, the, it, the survival um, analysis, I think it's not, we're not ready for a final survival analysis, but the first cut of data looked at a progression-free survival. So I agree completely. Progression-free survival should not be the endpoint of prevention and maintenance studies, but it gives us our first clue that they're beneficial. So ongoing analysis of, of survival, A, and ongoing analysis of identifying the patients where we can discontinue therapy uh, are both important to answer these exact questions that you guys have. Dr. Wiesel, any follow-up on that? I, I, I agree with uh, Jonathan. You know, there's a, 
a number, there's a very large international trial that's been reported, God, it's already three, four years ago, the IFM 2009 trial, where they gave one year of maintenance. The US has the same exact trial that was giving three years of maintenance to ask, answer, answer the question if you can get by with one year or three years. The US data still hasn't reported out, and I'm not sure I understand why, maybe Jonathan knows why. But uh, that, that's just a one year versus three years. But most of the current trials are looking at MRD, uh, just as Jonathan alluded to, MRD as an endpoint. If you get minimal residual disease, should, can you stop the drug or should you continue? And that's exactly the kind of trials that they're being designed, stop versus continue, and see what happens to those patients and see if we can get people drug-free uh, period of, of time um, that could potentially last for years. Um, yes, it's very expensive. Just so people know, there is a generic revenue that's available now. Um, interesting, I just found out yesterday what the cost difference was between the generic and the name brand Revlimid, and it was a 7% difference. It's, it's like, it's almost not non-existing, even though you say, oh, generics are so much cheaper. If you go to the pharmacy and you get Claritin versus Loratadine, you'll see a huge difference, but at least in the Revlimid so far, it was, I think it was 7% difference in the cost of generic versus trade name. But yes, it's very expensive, and, and there certainly are long-term repercussions for being on chronic maintenance therapy that hopefully we'll be able to answer, A, how long, and, uh, um, and is it truly necessary for everybody? All right. Great, great question. Good, good discussion. Uh, so here's another one. Uh, how do you select... Uh, based on what we know now, are there advantages? Of how do you select uh, CAR T therapy or the bispecifics? So this is a right in, in, in March of 2022. It's an easy answer because there's no bispecifics that are approved. The question is: is in the future, what which one are we going to sequence? And I'm not sure what. Jonathan and Daniel say that I'm going to go with the CAR T cell, you know, uh, across the board because the bispecifics are continuous therapy and the CAR T cells are one and done. And right now, based on at least the CARTITUDE data, it looks like the CAR T cells are more efficacious than uh, the bispecifics. But, you know, the, you don't have to be in the hospital. You don't have to go on the machine. It's readily available. You don't have to wait for generation of the CAR T cells. So there's certainly people that would say, um, I would go with the bispecifics. The bispecifics probably have a little bit less CRS, so they're more likely to be administered by a private physician outside of an academic center, which is probably still going to do probably the vast, vast majority of CAR T cells are going to be done in academic centers versus your neighborhood oncologist, which can give the bispecifics. So it's, it's not an easy answer. Jonathan, Daniel? Yeah, I mean, I think, I, I hope we don't have the challenge that we have now of, of, of the one slot a month, you know, it, it for CAR T cells. Um, I think the, uh, I, I think if a patient needs therapy, needs highly effective therapy tomorrow, um, uh, a CAR T cell is not going to be the answer. Um, because the reason we're thinking about a CAR T cell is that the regular stuff that we're doing isn't working. And so if a patient has, um, and, and so if it, assuming we live in a world where we have both by specific and CAR T cells available, if a patient really needs therapy quickly, then I think we're going to do the by specifics. And if a patient, if we have a patient who, who has, who meets the criteria for, for, um, for CAR T cell, and we know that we can ha they can be, they can, we can do something for them for a month to keep them from being very sick, then that's the patient we're going to, we're going to lean towards CAR T cell, assuming it's readily available. Um, and, and so I, but I, I think ultimately it's not going to be an either or. Um, and so, um, I think, I think we're going to be using both. I think the future of CAR T cell is likely going to be while the therapy is one and done. I think, I think we're going to be going to move towards a post CAR T cell maintenance. Um, 
Um, that's going to be the, the next generation of studies out there. Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure that I think, you know, it, 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 the concept of CAR T cell versus bispecific as a debate is very interesting. But I think I think there's going to be a lot more practical answers to how it's used as opposed to really uh, having a distinct algorithm. Just as, a, as an addition to that, there's no reason you can't have, there's increasing data that says you have a CAR T cell, even if it gets, it's against the greenhouse, again, it's still possible to get a bispecific after that against the greenhouse. Daniel's group has actually some very, very promising data that uh, if you had a CAR T cell and then you follow that up at some point in the future with a bispecific against the same greenhouse, you still can get activity. So it's not... Not mutually exclusive. Right. Okay. Well, I think that's a lot of questions we've got. Now, Robin mentioned that we're going to have the slides available to you to go at a little slower pace so you don't feel like you got overwhelmed today. That's one thing the IMF does. We put on these programs and then we put the slides in the program on our website. So you can just do the slides or you can do the program and the slides. Very important to us because this is a very uh, complicated disease, but we're a very tight family trying to figure out what's going on. I want to thank my speakers today first, and then we'll go on to some, some, uh, some stuff I have to cover. Daniel, thank you so much. Thank Dave, you. Thank you so much. And Jonathan, you guys are great this Saturday and it's much appreciated. Robin Tui, thanks for handling the questions. I always appreciate that. Now, when this is all over, you're going to get the feedback survey, and I want you to fill that out. Everyone wants to know what you think. It's very important. We had probably the most questions I've seen in one of these in years. And the next slide, please. Sponsors. Again, again, and again. We couldn't do this about our sponsors. Amgen, GSK, Jensen, Bristol Myers Squibb, Cherry Farm, and Takeda Oncology. Next slide. Is that it, Megan? There we go. All right. Fill out that form. We'll see you next time. The next RCW is April 2nd. Go to our website. And everyone really, really appreciate the new format here. Have a great day. Bye.